So East and West in our global family. I had fun looking at some of Goethe's poetry and playing with uh, trying translation and stuff. And here we are in the Mid-Earth Sea. Mediterranean means Mid-Earth. And culturally, it truly is between West and East, between North and South. And those two red dots, of course, are Marrakesh and my, my, my Mallorca, where I live. So the ancient Greeks called science philosophia, the lover of wisdom. And the whole point was that this lover of wisdom takes guidance in human affairs from nature itself by studying it. And that is exactly why I became a scientist, even though not all scientists agreed that that was the true purpose of science. Anyway, being an evolution biologist makes you a deep pastist in order to be a good futurist, because if you know where you've come from, you stand a better chance of seeing where you might be able to go. We have had mostly creative stories told by the major world's religions, and the Western Abrahamic religions on the one hand, the Eastern religions on the other, and they have only recently really started to come together. So the creation stories then changed because when secular societies were uh, invented, developed, evolved, we gave science the mandate to tell us the creation story. And it gave us a story of a non-living universe with life of fierce struggle in scarcity against the tide of entropy running us down and consciousness being squeezed out of brains eventually. Now, I think that's the saddest creation story I've ever heard. And uh, so I had to look more deeply into it. It came from Thomas Malthus, who was Darwin's friend. And as Darwin said himself in The Origin of Species, this is the doctrine of Malthus applied with manifold force to every aspect of the animal and vegetable kingdom. So here was a socio-political theory applied to nature. So I had to look a little bit further into this. Is fierce competition really human nature. Well, what did the story do to us? It grew a world economy in which we liquidated the Earth's natural assets, as you've been hearing this morning. And they were driven by consumption growth, demand that we shop, literally, even after 9-11, tomorrow, the anniversary, that we should shop our way out of the disaster. We grew an economy that put us into the sixth global extinction and humans are the first to cause one. If you stand on the moon and could see Earth over time, you would see that the distinction of our species is that we are a desert-making species. We have expanded deserts over time, and now with the hot age rolling on, we're going to make them even bigger. So now we're adding also pollution emitting and extinction causing and things like that to our biological claim to fame as a species. If aliens were watching us, and perhaps they are, would they consider us an intelligent species? Does an intelligent species destroy its own life support system? Here we are. We've got a popcorn effect going now of ever more frequent natural disasters. And at the same time, we've got ever more frequent human-made disasters of other kinds. And these crises seem to be leaving many of us in denial. Are we afraid of ourselves that we don't know how to deal with everything from energy crises, food prices rising, terrorism, unemployment, et cetera, et cetera? It's what we're facing today. So no wonder we panic, deny, and go on shopping. And I suggest to you that what we need is a more inspiring story of ourselves and our future. So let's see what we can do. What if there's more to this evolution story? What if evolution is an intelligent improvisational dance, as a woman might see it? And also my favorite author, Lyle Watson. In the East, in Vedanta, in Tao, in Kotadama, consciousness is the source of all reality, rather than all reality being the source of consciousness. Quite a different view of things. So what if you see this great cosmic consciousness as a source of everything. And the physicists tell us that the universe is all made of vibrations, so why not call it a keyboard of frequencies? And up at, as the cosmic consciousness begins to form worlds, mind and spirit are in the high vibrations, and then you get to this 
what we call zero-point energy field as a source of particles. And then we get down, step it down a little further, you get electromagnetic energy, and eventually you get to the slower vibrations of matter, right? Western science starts at that end of the keyboard, and the Eastern religions were looking at consciousness from the other end of the keyboard. When are we going to realize that it's only one universe, it's all one keyboard, and we've got to take down the unnatural barriers that we set up between the music in the high keys and the music in the low keys. Uh, Rumi says, I have put duality away and see two worlds as one. Isn't that beautiful? If we assume the universe is alive, might biology be the leading science rather than physics and giving us a cosmology of intelligent, self-creating living systems? It's a very different way of looking at things from the way I was taught. But many of my fellow scientists now see the Earth as being just as alive as the creatures it has given birth to. So I think life is just too intelligent to proceed one accident at a time, as I was taught in evolution biology. Now, interestingly, while the capitalist West had adopted the Darwinian competition uh, mode of evolution, the communist East was picking up Kropotkin's story of evolution as cooperation. So both sides were politicizing the theory. And in my view, they're both half theories. And actually, nature does both of these things. So let's look at what that would look like. If you see ecosystems, as ecologists talk about them, you will see that they come in different varieties. A type one ecosystem, which is called pioneer, is very Darwinian. The species are scarfing all the resources they can get. They're hogging territory. They're multiplying as fast as possible. And they're very competitive. Now, if you look over at a type three ecosystem called climax, implying a sequence, but they don't see that sequence, it's very Kropotkinian. Everything's cooperating. They're sharing territory and resources. They're feeding each other. Very cooperative. What I saw there was a maturation curve from a youthful mode to a mature mode. And so I developed this theory. It starts with a unity, like the homogenized early Earth with all the minerals mixed up in the crust, indistinguishable. And from that unity is birth individuation. Little bacteria began to package themselves on the surface of the Earth. Whenever you have individuals, you start getting tension and conflict happening. This is the Darwinian part of the cycle. If they don't kill each other off, they start some negotiations with each other. And some of those negotiations lead to strategies that resolve conflicts and actually set up cooperative schemes, which in the best case, and this is rare in evolution, is when a whole new unity is born at a larger size level as a cooperative. So let's see how it works. Here's my happier story of evolution, and I like to call it bacteria are us. Okay. Because you're going to see there, we are more like the ancient bacteria of Earth than any species in between. It's really fun. The early Earth was populated only by these archaebacteria. Nowadays, they're called archaea. And what they did was really remarkable, because they're the first things that they covered the Earth, only bacteria, invisible. And they caused worldwide crises of hunger and then of pollution. And they solved them both. So they harnessed solar energy to develop photosynthesis to make food in the midst of the hunger crisis. They invented breathing as a way of life. And the breathers invented electric motors to get around in faster. The competitive stage always drives a lot of technology. Comes out of war, right? They created the first World Wide Web of DNA exchange, an information language exchange worldwide, the first World Wide Web billions of years ago. And they evolved a huge cooperative new cell, which is the only other kind of cell ever to evolve on the Earth. It's the kind that you and I are made of. Okay. I can't show you the true size of the big cooperative, because it has to be more than 1,000 times bigger than the little bacterium. But this is what the bacteria did. They got together. They all gave a little of their DNA to the central library called nucleus. And so they had less. They had to stay within the cell forever after. 
and they just did divisions of labor that gave you an extraordinarily complex large cell. Now, what had happened was that the creative cooperation that's the maturity represented by this big nucleated cell becomes the junior, the new thing in the earth. And what the bacteria had discovered in order to, to create that cooperative was that it's cheaper to feed your enemies than to kill them. Remember that, if nothing else, from this talk. <laughs> so after a feisty competitive billion year, uh, another billion years, these nucleated cells built multi-celled creatures. That was the next stage in evolution where cooperation came in. So here we are. We're a big brain experiment, and the results are not yet in. But notice that even our brains integrate east and west, left and right hemispheres. Quite interesting. Now, no science is possible without making basic assumptions about the universe you're studying. You have to have some notion of what it is you're studying to theorize about it. So, so science rests on these cosmologies I started talking about at the beginning. And these fundamental assumptions or axioms, for instance, amount to a worldview, and in Western science, a non-living universe can be studied objectively without interfering in it. Consciousness emerges late in the game, and life has come from non-life. These are basic unproven assumptions that are made. OK, now whether consciousness creates matter or matter creates consciousness, it seems, turns out, to be a matter of belief called scientific axiom. It's cultural. It's what your current notion that seems perfectly obvious is all about. And that has differed in different parts of the world. Now, even in the West, some of us initiated what's called a paradigm shift with cosmic life replacing non-life as the universal basic and with consciousness primary instead of emerging late in the game. So in 2008, I convened a, a, an international symposium to get scientists who had been taught the one set of assumptions and who had shifted to the other to write them all out very formally. And we did that in Hokkaido. We listed many assumptions in the process. And during the symposium, I had an epiphany. I was teaching an evolution biology of growing up out of competition into cooperation. And here I was participating in a paradigm shift where we were going to conquer the old assumptions and replace them with the new ones. I said, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. Why don't we talk about a glo global consortium of sciences where different cultures can publicly state their fundamental assumptions and play in the game of being legitimate sciences? So since two different cosmologies give us two different sciences, life arising from non-life by a series of fortuitous accidents in the one case, life arising by self-organization in a living universe in the other case. There we had two already. So I held a second symposium in Kuala Lumpur in 2009 for Islamic scientists. And we had them write down all their basic assumptions. And since Allah created the universe as the first one and the second one is Allah created a living universe, I said, hooray, now we've got a living universe to work with. You won't get your credentials from Western science, but do something they haven't done. Do something they haven't done. And how about a science of economics that studies nature rather than assuming human nature? Imagine a consortium of East-West sciences with equal validity and mutual respect built on their culturally diverse assumptions. This solution, rather than the conquest of one paradigm by another, represents a mature collaborative mode, a fruitful division of labor that we need now to solve our global problems. So let's look back at our beginnings a bit. We've survived about a dozen ice ages. 99% of human history, we were hunter-gatherers living among large mammals. If any of you have not yet seen Werner Herzog's Cave of Forgotten Dreams, do go see it. What does this 32,000-year-old art tell us? This sensitivity, this love of these huge, scary animals. Were these painted maybe by women priestesses of the mother goddess? I don't know. 
But there's love there. And I think these people were cooperating with these animals in ways that many indigenous people still do. You can talk to me more about that later if you like. 100,000 years of cooperative communities, we reached that maturity at the tribal level. Then we went into empire mode. We built a lar large cooperative, a civilization, a city, and that became the new kid on the block. And so we now have the age of empires ending now because empires went back into the juvenile mode, right? Of conquest, of all that yang stuff. The youthful competition, control, order, mine, yours, monoculture, fear and scarcity. And we're moving now to global family, to the yin of the mature cooperation, the messiness and mystery, the we and ours, the diversity and creativity, the love and abundance. So back to the moon. It's time for us to become a desert greening species. Unfortunately, it's not difficult and it's not expensive. We have to adapt to life in a hot aid. We have the technologies to do it. Many discovered long ago in Morocco, and you just heard about solar desert solutions. They abound. And the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. <laughs> we don't have to wait for the oil to run out. We don't have to. We already have $2.4 trillion invested in green businesses around the world. We know that organic agriculture is healthy, restores soils and water makes jobs. The only way to double the food population, the food supply in the world is to go back to small farms and natural methods. That is a fantastic thing. It has not gotten into the press. Nature integrates opposites. It conserves what works. It's radically creative with what doesn't work. After every global extinction, you've got loads of new species appearing as if that didn't work. Let's do something different. Crises always bring us opportunities. And it's our turn. We can and must reinvent our whole world. Hooray, what a great opportunity. We didn't, it wasn't working. OK, we need a real science of economics. And I hope that the Islamic scientists may distinguish themselves by doing that one. Based on nature's mature systems, such as our own bodies, every one of our bodies has 100, 100 trillion cooperating cells, each as complex as a large human city, 30,000 recycling centers per cell, 1,000 bankers per cell, giving out free money, no debts. <laughs> it's to spend into the economy. Money was never intended to be issued as debt. All the religions forbade it thousands of years ago, the debt money. It shouldn't be either a commodity or a debt. So I'm going to end with this beautiful Hafiz poem in honor of Goethe and his love of Hafiz. Even after all this time, the sun never once says to Earth, Earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. And so I look at youth on the internet. I see they are, are not into racism, warfare, or greed. In a single generation, they could create a new world, peaceful revolutions as you see them happening. So it's our evolutionary mandate to create sustainable global economics, to truly become a global family. And Rumi says, why do you stay in prison when the door is so wide open? Or again, let the beauty of what you love be what you do. There are a thousand ways to kiss the earth. So I say to you all, do what makes your heart sing to make a better world for all. Thank you so much. Great.